So we're told to help build the kingdom of God wherever we go. I took that really literally and built a huge church in this Minecraft server. Sup guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity, and I am back after four months. You might be like, what are you talking about? You just posted two days ago. Well, yeah, but I recorded all the videos for the past four months in advance because I've been at college and, you know, I have studying to do. So I didn't play any Minecraft while I was at college, but now I'm back. Oh, there's a dancing bee on this tree. I, that beehive wasn't there last I checked. Anyway, okay, that bee is so excited that I'm back. Anyway, yes, uh, Redeemed Zoomer is back, and today is going to be a Q&A video. So first, I'm just going to show you guys around the church for those of you who haven't seen it before. And then I'm just going to answer all of your questions that you submitted on Instagram a few days ago. If you guys have more questions, I'll do this every few months or so. But yeah, so I've been working on this big church for a long time. It's completely in survival. It's a reformed Presbyterian church, is why you see a Presbyterian cross there. And, um, yeah, I've been building it for a long time, but now I've just updated this Minecraft server, so that means there's a lot of new resources that can generate in the natural world. But because this server is so huge, and it's existed for so many years, I have to travel really far away to get those resources. So once I show you guys around my church, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> travel over to a really far, un undiscovered region to get the resources, and while I'm doing that, I'll be answering your questions. So this is the main sanctuary, and if you hear music, it's because um, I have an organ that automatically plays Psalm 1 from the Genevan Psalter. Um, so that means this church is a Calvinist church by design, because it literally has a Calvinist hymn tune, the Genevan Psalter, built into it. Let me turn up the volume so you guys can hear it. Um, hold on. Yeah, so I have, um, if you look under here, there's a bunch of, um, note blocks that keep playing this. Alright, pretty cool. But I know that that's not what you're here for. You're here for your questions to be answered, so that's my job. I'm gonna go answer your questions, which you guys have submitted on Instagram. And, yeah, while I do that, I'm gonna be traveling all around this, I'm gonna travel all around this church. Sorry, no, I'm gonna travel all around this Minecraft server. Because I am not the only one in this Minecraft server. This server has existed for many years. I think this world was started in 2014. And it's been updated so many times, and it used to actually have mods. Not anymore. But the terrain structures are a lot more exotic than you'll find on, like, a typical Minecraft server. Because it used to have, it used to have the mods. Okay, so I'm pulling up all your questions now on my phone from Instagram. Okay, so question number one is why don't I accept the Lutheran view of predestination as most biblical? Because if I did, I would be Lutheran. No, seriously. Okay, I, I know the question is like, okay, what's your, um, what's your disagreement with the Lutheran view of predestination? So I don't think the Lutheran view of predestination is the biblical view. Now, I think half of it is. But what the Lutheran view of predestination tries to do is tries to take part of Calvinism and part of Arminianism, even though, I mean, Arminianism didn't exist at, during the time of Martin Luther. But it basically tries to take two contradictory ideas and smash them together because they think it sounds good. Here's what I'm talking about, in case you don't know. So Calvinism says, or a Calvinist view of predestination says that it's God's choice who is who ends up being saved and who's not salvation is by faith alone but we can't come to faith unless god calls us to faith so the calvinist view is god's in charge of who will end up having faith and who won't the arminian view which arose in response to the calvinist view is that everyone has a free will choice a completely free will choice there's my church from the distance looks pretty cool next to those mountains Everyone has a free will choice whether or not to um, come to faith. And what Lutheranism does is it says if you are saved, if you do come to faith, it wasn't because of your choice. It was because God predestined you to have faith. However, if you do not have faith, that's because of your free will choice. You, um, because you resisted God's saving grace. So they say, like, as to why some people are saved, they say it's because of God why some people are not saved, that 
It's because of man. So they that sounds really good on the surface, but if you really look into it, um, it doesn't really make sense. And they would admit that it doesn't make sense. They would admit that it's a mystery. From my perspective as a Calvinist, it seems more like a contradiction than a mystery. Because um, they believe in something called single predestination, that God predestines people to be saved, and this isn't everyone, but God doesn't predestine anyone not to be saved. Double predestination is the Calvinist position that God predestines some to be saved and others to not be saved. Now, not all forms of double predestination are supralapsarian. My position is the infralapsarian position. It's a really long, a much longer word than it needs to be. Basically, infralapsarian means that God's predestination of some people to not be saved is passive. He just passes over them. He doesn't actively create evil in them. The supralapsarian position, the one I disagree with, says that God actively wills for people to be damned and basically has no love for the non-elect at all. And I don't agree with that. There are some Calvinists who would say that, but they're in the minority. Okay, so I'm traveling through other cities in my world. This is what some parts of my world look like because it's just so old. So many people have been on it for so many years and built so many things. All right, next question. Did the Holy Spirit bring you to the Presbyterian Church? Someone asks. The Holy Spirit made me Christian. I wouldn't deny that. If I said the Holy Spirit made me a Presbyterian, then you'd have to ask, why doesn't the Holy Spirit make everyone a Presbyterian? The only way way you could answer that is, is to say only the only Presbyterians are real Christians, which of course I wouldn't say. So I'd say the Holy Spirit made me a Christian, and God's providence made me a Presbyterian. God put me where I am for reasons known only to himself. I can maybe catch a glimpse of it in this life. But I think God places people where, they're, where they are because of his own will. And we don't always know why God does what he does. So, um, I'm going to take the train out of the city because I'm going to travel a lot by train. There's a whole system of trains in my world. So, yeah, the Holy Spirit made me Christian. God's providence made me Presbyterian. God's providence makes some people Lutheran, Catholic, Baptist, whatever. Okay, next question. Which is the worst denomination of these three, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, or Seventh-day Adventists? Okay, so I'm going to have to say Jehovah's Witnesses. Of the three, the Seventh-day Adventists are least heretical. It's like they're borderline heretical, but not explicitly heretical the way Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are. And between Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses are definitely worse. Definitely a more radical departure from Christianity, even though Mormonism still isn't Christianity. Like, there are at least some admirable things about Mormonism to some extent. Like, they are known stereotypically, and it's a true stereotype, for having the best character and stuff, and really good values. For Jehovah's Witnesses, um, there really aren't those like, redeeming qualities. It's just, it's all, like, a cult, basically. And, okay, I think something is frozen here. Hold on. This is probably some server lag. There we go. Um, so yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses are definitely the worst out of the three. Next one is, why aren't you Catholic? What makes Luther correct instead of the Catholic Church? Uh, there's a lot of reasons why Luther was right over the Catholics, but Luther considered himself a Catholic who was trying to reform the Catholic Church. He was forcibly kicked out. He's not someone who wanted to start his own thing. And I don't think Luther did start his own thing. It wasn't Luther himself that started the Reformation. It was Luther being kicked out of the church that started the Reformation because people were like, okay, there's a really big corruption problem. We know the Pope is not going to address these really serious issues, so we need to. So, yeah, that is, Luther was definitely right about that. And obviously I'm not a Lutheran, I'm a Calvinist, so I don't think Luther was right about everything. He was right in his criticisms of the Pope, for sure. Um, okay, uh, what is, someone asks, what is your testimony, and who told you about Christ? So, yes, I was not born Christian. I was not baptized as a child, and it's not because my parents were Baptists, because they weren't. Um, I was, yeah, I was just raised sort of in a very secular environment. I was secular growing up. So yes, I do have a testimony. Someone asks, who told you about Christ? 
So I converted to Christianity when I went to a Christian-themed music camp. But it wasn't because anyone actually tried to evangelize to me. It was just seeing their character, seeing the character of a lot of the Christians is what persuaded me to be a Christian. No one came up to me and said, have you heard about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? No one tried to um, say, you're a sinner and here's how to get saved. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing to do, but I'm saying... I, it's not absolutely necessary to convert people. And dang, the server is really lagging today. It's because I'm trying to travel a bunch of places. Maybe it's because I'm in two minecarts at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's the answer to that question. Um, someone asks, best way to plant seeds of truth for friends who are progressive Christians or atheists? That's um, honestly what I would... Uh, it's, it's similar to what I would say for the previous question. Um... There's the, like, African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick. So, I am extremely guilty of this, so I'm com a complete hypocrite for saying this, but don't try to argue that much. Just try to live like Christ and be extremely careful and selective as to when specifically you're going to get into discussions, when specifically you're going to have debates and mostly focus on building up a reputation as someone with a trustworthy and honorable character. Again, I am quite a hypocrite in saying that, but that is the advice I would give for planting seeds of truth. That's the most I've, um, that's what I've had the most success with. I've never argued anyone into faith. I, I, I know some people theoretically can, but I've never done that. Okay, someone asks, are you inspired by any Catholic saints? I mean, I would say people like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, but as a Reformed person, I consider them part of the Reformed tradition because the Reformed tradition didn't begin in the 16th century. It began with, with Jesus and the apostles because um, we are a branch of the tree. We are not the whole tree, but we're a branch of the tree, and all the branches have the same root. Now, if, if any of you guys are Eastern Orthodox, I know a lot of my Eastern Orthodox followers get really angry when I talk about branch theory. They're like, we are the one true church. How dare you compare us to these other churches that are not us? It's like, guys, if I believed that, I would be Orthodox. I'm a Protestant, which means I don't believe any one organization has a monopoly on who's the true church. If I believe otherwise, I would immediately cease to be a Protestant. I don't see why that's so hard to understand by some people. Okay, um, this is actually a related question. Someone asks, what do you think about Eucharistic miracles? So, um, there are a lot of claims by the Catholic Church that when they do the Eucharist, Holy Communion, that miraculously ma miraculous things happen. And some people argue that this proves that the Catholic Church is the one true church. The Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church and the Coptic Church is all claimed to be the one true church. I think they're all true churches, but none of them is the one true church. Anyway, so... I th I'm open to the possibility that Eucharistic miracles happen. thing is, I don't think they only happen in the Roman Catholic Church. I think they do happen in the Catholic Church. But I've, there have been stories of miracles and amazing spiritual things in all sorts of churches. Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Baptist, even Pentecostal. And if you want to say that like only one of them is the true church, you have to say the miracles of another church are either fake or, like, caused by demons, and that could be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, almost, because um, Jesus did say that, like, I don't know if that's actually what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. I'm still trying to figure out what that means exactly. Um, I think it honestly means something a bit different. But still, to ascribe the work of the Holy Spirit to a demon is not something you want to do. Um, okay, I'm hoping when I get off the train this is going to stop freezing. Um, so I would say, yeah, it's possible Eucharistic miracles are valid, but that doesn't necessarily prove the exclusivity of the Catholic Church. That just proves that the Holy Spirit is active in the Catholic Church, which of course I believe. I believe the Holy Spirit is active in the Protestant Church as well, and the Orthodox Church, and all the churches that confess that Jesus is God, because that's what the New Testament says, that no, no one can confess Jesus is God except by the Holy Spirit. All right, um... Someone says, at what point doctrinally do you believe churches should be in communion with each other? This is a this is a good question. So, for example, Lutheran churches will not 
um, be in communion with Reformed churches because they think our view of the Lord's Supper is severely heterodox. Now, the relationship between Lutheran and Reformed churches is that we like them more than they like us. Like, I really like Lutherans, but Lutherans don't really like the Reformed. Um, but yeah, there is there is something like there is a category of churches can't be in communion if they disagree on severe issues. So I would say that we need to have a category of heterodox but not heretical. So orthodox, the word orthodox, I'm not referring necessarily to the Eastern Orthodox Church, the word itself just means like, it just means right belief. And heterodox means other belief. Heresy means it's like completely wrong and you've basically invented your own new religion. So heterodox is between orthodox and heretical. It's not a true belief, but it's also not enough to disqualify you from being Christian. But I would say that heterodoxy can disqualify one from, like, taking part in, like, <clears throat> like churches communing with each other and taking part in the Lord's Supper with each other. So, yeah, um, a heterodox teaching from the perspective of someone like me, a Protestant, would be that salvation is not by faith alone. Now, a lot of my Protestant and especially Reformed friends would say that Catholics are heretics because they... Oh, the train is broken here. That Catholics are heretics because they deny that salvation is by faith alone. I, th I don't think they're heretics for that. I think they're still true Christians. I would say they're heterodox, though, because salvation by faith alone is important. At the same time, I, I would say that Baptists are also heterodox because they deny the real presence, for the most part. I know there are some some Reformed Baptists that don't deny this. There are also a lot of Reformed Baptists who claim to not deny this, but still essentially deny this. Baptists generally deny the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Now, the Reformed people don't believe in transubstantiation, but we believe in spiritual real presence, that even though the bread doesn't change, we still spiritually receive the true body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. And that's not good enough for the Lutherans. Lutherans say it needs to be a physical presence. But I think it's good enough because I don't think the Bible specifies how Christ is present. It just says that Christ is present. And there are other reasons to believe the presence is a spiritual presence because it's for our spiritual nourishment rather than our physical nourishment. Um, but anyway. Um, so yeah, it, denying that salvation is by faith alone is a heterodoxy. Denying the real presence of Christ in the supper is a heterodoxy. Um, and there are other heterodoxies that I would say, yeah, they, that would mean that churches wouldn't be in communion with each other. Like, I can embrace Baptists as my brothers and sisters in Christ. I would not permanently attend a Baptist church as, like, my church because they don't believe in the real presence, and that's a big thing. They don't really believe, generally speaking, I know there's some exceptions with Reformed Baptists, they generally believe the sacraments are just symbols, and I consider that a, a severe heterodoxy because it completely contradicts what the Bible says. The Bible says baptism saves. Jesus said, this is my body. So I know I sound a little bit Lutheran there, but it's only because a lot of reform people in the modern world are a lot more Baptist leaning than like John Calvin was. Um, and all the church fathers had an interpretation of those passages that the sacraments actually do bring salvation. They're not just symbols. Um, but yeah, so there are some things that would say, Oh, I, I can still recognize them as brothers and sisters in Christ, but they're heterodox, meaning I wouldn't actually permanently attend their churches. Okay, um, someone asks, will we have jobs or will we do work in the new heavens and the new earth? Absolutely, 100%. We were made to work. Like, um, in the garden, uh, Garden of Eden, like, I think the first instruction was to work the garden. Depending on how literally you take that story, it doesn't matter. The purpose is that work is good. It's a, it's a condition of the fall, of sin, that work is often, like, painful. But in the new, new Heavens and the New Earth, we will do rewarding work. For example, Minecraft is technically work. I'm working to build cool things in Minecraft. And But the thing is, because I love the work I'm doing, it's a joy to work in Minecraft. There's nothing painful about working in Minecraft, unless, like, some, like, a, a, I don't know, a, a ghast nukes your entire inventory. Um, no, I, I don't know what I just said. For the most part, 
Minecraft is work, but it's really rewarding work that is very pleasing. So yes, that kind of work will absolutely be in the new heavens and the new earth. All right, someone else asks, do you think, should we use Gregorian chants in reformed churches? Good question. So I think Christianity is beautiful because it's diverse. And to preserve that diversity, I actually think it's a good thing for different churches to do worship a bit differently. I think, generally speaking, churches should stick to what's in their tradition. So part of the Reformed tradition is, what characterizes the Reformed tradition is singing psalms. I think, I'm not one of those people who thinks we need to be exclusively singing psalms. I'm not for exclusive psalmody. I am for psalmody. I think Reformed churches should be characterized by their psalm singing. And um, if we want to do Gregorian chants on the side, sure, Gregorian chants are awesome. And they're great. Um, I listened to Gregorian chants for six hours straight two days ago when I was studying for my differential equations final because I needed a lot of prayer for that, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And hey, the next question relates to that. It says, what is your major? What was I studying for? Well, I'm a math major. I was studying differential equations. I'm also a music major. Math and music are very closely connected. Uh, that was the, the medieval people. The medieval church saw math and music as almost like the same thing. And it's a product of modernity that people see math and music as separate. M music used to be seen as more of a science than an art. And by the way, this... this um, Big, big building over here is what used to be my house many years ago in in this Minecraft server. Like, this is something I built in, like, 2014. Okay, just some history of this Minecraft world. Um, yeah, that's my major. I'm a double major in mathematics and music. Okay, someone said, I would love to hear you explain infant baptism. I was raised Baptist, now newly PCA. Okay, well, congrats on coming to uh, the one true Presbyterian faith. Just kidding. It, the Presbyterian church isn't the one true church. And also, the PCA is half Baptist. I said what I said. I don't care. Um, the PCA is, it is, like, conservative, but it's very influenced by Baptist theology, so that's why I hesitate to join the PCA, despite being pretty theologically conservative. I'm still in the PCUSA. I know all the problems with the PCUSA. I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent. That wasn't your question. I apologize. Your question was, I, you'd love to hear me explain infant baptism. You were raised Baptist, now newly PCA. Um, so the PCA is maybe Baptist-influenced, but they still practice infant baptism. So they're not Baptist-influenced in, in that sense. So why do Presbyterians baptize babies? It can seem very strange to people raised in a Baptist, like a Baptist culture. It's because um, baptism is not a sign of faith. It's a sign of the covenant. Baptism does what circumcision did in the Old Testament. It really makes someone part of God's people. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were all God's people. Not all of them were saved, but they were all God's people. And circumcision made them one of God's people. So the church is what Israel was. Um, we're not dispensationalists. We don't believe that the Jews in today's world are God's chosen people. We believe the church is God's chosen people. And so baptism just does what circumcision did. It makes a child part of God's people. Here's my favorite analogy. Um, if you, conv if you um, are born into a country, you become a citizen of that country by birth in, in most countries. There are some countries, I think, that do it a bit differently. Um, you become a citizen by birthright. However, if you um, are an immigrant and you want to become a citizen of a different country, there's a long process you have to actually commit to that country. So if you're born into a Christian family, you're a Christian by being born into a Christian family. Baptists would disagree. I would say Christian babies are Christian. If they're baptized, they become a Christian at baptism. That doesn't mean they're, they will end up being saved in the end, but they're still a Christian. They're part of the covenant. So baptism is citizenship in the kingdom of God. Um, so when a baby is baptized, you can say that baby is now a Christian. Like traditionally speaking, in traditional language, to baptize something means to make it a, a Christian. There is, there's even like, I think some sailors would like baptize their boats, they call it christening, and say this boat is now a Christian boat. So, um, and like when people say Thomas Aquinas was just appropriating Aristotle's philosophy, they say he was baptizing Aristotle. So 
um, when that's why when Presbyterians say baptism saves, we don't mean what the Catholics mean, um, which is that baptism has an automatic efficacy unto salvation. What we mean is that we're defining baptism as both the outward water and the thing it symbolizes, which is being a Christian. So it's right to say Christianity saves. Baptism makes you a Christian. So if you have an effective baptism, meaning you end up staying a Christian, the, yeah, baptism saves because baptism brings you into the Christian family. Um, there are cases of people who can be saved without baptism, but under ordinary circumstances, it's completely right to say baptism saves because it's it's not just a symbol. It's, it is a symbol, but God works real grace through it to make someone part of the kingdom of God. Um, so it's not quite a Lutheran view of baptismal regeneration, but it is baptismal efficacy. Baptism is not just an, an empty sign. John Knox in the Scots Confession said, We utterly damn the vanity of those who affirm the sacraments to be nothing else but naked and bare signs. And John Knox is the father of Presbyterianism. So yeah, we take what he says on that very seriously. Okay, discuss your thoughts on the CREC. I think that's the... Um, Convention, either convention or connection, one of those two. Convention of Reformed Evangelical Churches. So it's a denomination that's different from all the other Reformed denominations because they teach something called Federal Vision. I know some Federal Vision, federal vision people are, being, are like, no, Federal Vision doesn't exist anymore. It was just the name of one conference. Guys, it, it kind of exists, and I don't, I don't know what else to call it. There's a sort of a group within Reformed Christianity that sort of disagrees with a lot of the mainstream reformed christianity because they believe in things like pedo communion giving communion to babies now we give we baptize babies but we don't give communion to babies um john knox who was very for infant baptism is also very against um infant communion my analogy is baptism is citizenship in the kingdom communion is an active participation in the kingdom you become a citizen of your country at birth but you actively participate like voting and serving in the military when you're mature. So, of course, I'm against Pado communion Generally, the Reformed tradition has been against Pado communion There's some people um, in who do believe in Pado communion and they're what you would call the Federal Visionists. Now, Federal Vision has a bunch of other beliefs, such as like a post-millennial eschatology, and combined with theonomy, which believes that God's law in the Old Testament should be the law of the land in some way. So they generally support a theocracy and trying to they're always like, yo, we're Christian nationalists. And a lot of people misunderstand what the word Christian nationalism is even supposed to mean. Um, now, I will say this about the Federal Visionists. I don't think they're heretics. Some people say they're heretics because they define salvation in a sort of covenantal sense. And they talk about how the covenant is objective. I would actually kind of ag agree with that part. I think a lot of their criticisms of, like, mainstream conservative reform people, like the PCA, like I was talking about, the PCA has been influenced by Baptists. I think a lot of the Federal Visionists recognize that. So I agree with the motivations behind Federal Vision, but I don't agree with their conclusions. I don't agree with Pado Communion. I'm an amillennial, not a postmillennial. I don't agree with Theonomy. A few other things they believe I, I don't agree with, but I don't think they're heretics. So, no, I'm not one of those Doug Wilson theonomy fanboys, but I, I agree with a lot of their motivations. One of their motivations was they were like, they said to the mainstream Reformed people like R.C. Sproul, guys, you have a more Baptist view of the sacraments than an actual Reformed one, because a lot of modern Reformed people, especially in like the PCA, treat the sacraments like they're just symbols, and they're not. John Knox was very clear, we utterly damn the vanity of those who affirm the sacraments to be nothing else but naked and bare signs. Um, so they were right about that part. Where they were wrong is they ended up coming to some conclusions that are not really historically reformed. And it's it's too complicated to go into now. But, um, yeah, the CREC is the one denomination that teaches federal vision. Okay, will some denominations cease to exist in the future because of their aging demographics? Yes, the mainline churches will probably die out in the future because of their aging demographics unless we retake them by getting young evangelicals to retake the mainline churches. And we do need to retake the mainline churches because they're the historic and culturally rooted ones. And then if we do retake them because they're dying out anyway, we can just revive classical orthodox theology in them and 
take them back from the theological liberals who have um, sort of taken over. All right. Someone else says, Baptism I understand as a covenant, and both of my kids have just been baptized. A, praise God. I just want a deeper understanding. Okay. So, baptism does make them part of the covenant. Yes, it's the sign of the covenant. But it's not an empty sign. It's a sign that's linked to what it signifies. So the outpouring of water in baptism symbolizes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's also linked to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So baptism doesn't save immediately, necessarily. doesn't save automatically. But it's still connected to salvation in a real sense. Um, Westminster, the Westminster Confession of Faith says every sacrament is a sacramental union of the sign and the thing signified. So in, in some mystical way, baptism is really connected to salvation. So um, baptism does objectively make someone part of the covenant externally. Um, the outward baptism makes you part of the covenant externally. And the inward baptism makes you part of the invisible church. And the two are connected. Now, we can't always explain, like, how do we know, like, the intricacies of, like, how that works. But we do know that there is a spiritual relation between the outward sign and the inward reality signified. Because the scripture does say baptism saves. First Peter 3.21. We can't explain that away by saying, oh, it refers to spirit baptism. It doesn't say spirit baptism saves. It doesn't say water baptism saves. It says baptism saves. And in baptism, there's two elements. There's the outward washing with water, and there's the inward outpouring of the Holy Spirit that are connected. So baptism is more than just the outward administration of it, but um, the two are still connected. Now, not every baptism results in someone being eternally saved, but that happens if they reject the promises given in baptism. John Calvin, in his Geneva Catechism, said, um, the promises of salvation are off, are given to us in baptism as long as we don't render them unfruitful by unbelief. So even though we don't believe, as the Catholics do, that baptism saves automatically, we still think it's right to say baptism saves. Because if you're baptized, your default position is salvation if you don't reject the promises that baptism gives you. All right, thoughts on presuppositionalism. Okay, so presuppositionalism is one of the ways that people try to argue for Christianity. They think the way to argue for Christianity is to presuppose that Christianity is true and just try to point out the flaws in all other worldviews. Now, I, while there's some elements of this that can be used, because I do think we should point out the flaws in other worldviews, I don't like how it, the way it does this because it says that there's not really objective truth that we can all agree on it just make basically makes it sound like we all have our own worldview and we just need to like have the worldviews smash into each other and see who wins i'm a classical apologist meaning i think we should defend christianity with classical philosophy we can argue logically for the existence of god there's natural revelation that we have in common with unbelievers that christians and non-christians alike can appeal to and then from that position of natural revelation we can work from there um, we can establish logically first that God exists and then once we have established that it's not too much of a leap to establish that Christianity is the, the true religion then once we establish that God exists then you preach the gospel. You're like, okay, if God is perfect and you're not, how can you be reconciled to God? You can only be reconciled to God through Jesus, who is, tru Jesus, who is truly human and truly God. Okay, next question is, how to find a good Presby church? Okay, this is a spicy one. It depends on what your goal is. So, um, I, if your goal is just like, I need a church that will give good teaching to me and my kids look for a pca or an opc church but make sure that um you might want to check it out on a case-by-case -case basis because there are a lot of pca churches and opc churches that are very like evangelical influenced meaning they um don't really have a traditional worship style and they have a low view of the sacraments. So you're, I would say generally PCA, OPC is good, um, but evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis.
But if you want to get rooted in the Presbyterian tradition, and if you're confident that you can sort of study the in-depth theology on your own, if you really want to join the historic Presbyterian church, then you might actually want to check out the PCUSA. Um, this goes back to what I said. PCUSA is what I am. It's It has been, for the most part, taken over by people who are very theologically liberal. But when... But it is... The, the tragic thing is that it's the original Presbyterian church, and the PCA and the OPC were things that split off from the PCUSA. So something that we built over the course of centuries was just taken from us because liberals hijacked it and the conservatives just ran away. So if you want to actually be, participate in taking back what the liberals took from us, join a PCUSA church and get involved. What I always say is there's really two things that church gives us. It gives us um, it gives us theology, and it gives us ritual. Now, theology is something you can study on your own time. It's something you can supplement by yourself. Ritual is not something you can supplement by yourself. If you want ritual, you need to go to a church that's like historic and traditional. You're much more likely to find that in the PCUSA than in the PCA. So now, if you do go to a PCA church that's historic and traditional, has a historic building, does a traditional worship style with hymns and all that, has an organ, great. I know that's sort of external, but it, it's it's a sign of a more internal difference that one is clearly more historically and culturally rooted than the other. But if you um, if you're in a position where you're like new to reform theology, if you just want your kids to have a, a good Christian upbringing, yeah, I, you don't need to be a crusader for the mainline church. In that case, yeah, just go PCA. PCA or OPC, or um, my personal preference is, I, I, this is more rare, if you can find an eco-church, in the eco-denomination, it's called. it stands for Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians. Um, you can find on their website all the, their locations. I'd say those are actually the best, because they're relatively conservative, not quite as conservative as the PCA, relatively conservative like the PCA, but at the same time, they're um, they're still sort of... Sorry guys, the server crashed, so now I'm back over here. Anyway, next question. So, um, someone asks, what is amillennialism? What is the Presbyterian definition of grace, i.e. through the sacraments? This is a very good question. So first, amillennialism is the Presbyterian view of this millennial thousand year reign of Christ mentioned in Revelation. So people who believe in the rapture think that this thousand year reign of Christ is something in the future. It'll happen after Jesus comes back. There will be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth before like the final judgment and resurrection. The Presbyterian view is called amillennialism. We're not the only people who are amillennials. Basically most, the majority of traditional, actually Pretty much all traditional Christian branches are amillennial, like, you know, Catholic, Orthodox, Lutheran, Anglican, those people are amillennial, which is that we think that this thousand-year reign of Christ is happening now. It's something between Christ's first and second comings. We're in the already not yet. The um, thousand-year reign of Christ is not something in the future. It's a symbolic thousand years because Revelation is the most symbolic book in the Bible. So most denominations are amillennial. Baptists are divided between, I think they lean premillennial, but you'll find premillennials, amillennials, and postmillennials among Baptists. The second question here was, what is the Presbyterian definition of grace through the sacraments? That's a very good question, because Catholics tend to speak of grace as like a substance, and that's why they have seven sacraments. We only have two, but they have seven sacraments because they're like, well, all like marriage is a sacrament because God gives you grace in marriage. So we, we would, yeah, believe that God gives grace in marriage, but we're talking about saving grace here. And as a Presbyterian, as Presbyterians, we would say um, the only sacraments that give saving grace are baptism and communion. And this grace is not a substance. It's a eternal declaration. God's saving grace is the fact that God um, determines to save sinners. So the saving grace of God is only conveyed through the sacraments of baptism and communion. And they are only, a, this is the difference between the Reformed view of baptism saving and a Lutheran or Catholic view of baptism saving. The sacraments are only effective for those who have faith. Now, 
The verse that I think best illustrates this is 1 John 5, 8, which says, There are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. So the spirit is like faith, the water is baptism, and the blood is communion. But these three are all aspects of the same thing. So it's not like faith and baptism are two things on a checklist that are both independently required for salvation. They are aspects of the same thing. They, um, so they are in agreement with each other. So baptism is made effective by faith. It's only effective, effective for the elect or those who have faith. And um, baptism is outwardly connected to faith. Um, it is the outward the outward sign of the covenant and our um, membership in the covenant is validated by faith. So yeah, they are, the spirit, the water, and the blood are indeed in agreement. That is the Reformed view. That's a good question. Someone asks, why do you think the Reformed or Presbyterian tradition clo most closely matches the early church? Well, I, I don't. No, seriously, I don't think that if you look through the early church fathers, all of them, you'll say, hey, they, these guys were all Presbyterians. I don't think you'll say these guys are all Catholic or these guys were all Eastern Orthodox. I mean, if you come from like an evangelical, non-denominational perspective, compared to that, yeah, the early church fathers will all seem like they're Catholics. But no, like Lutheran, Reformed, Catholic, and Orthodox ideas can all be found in the early church. So I don't think like... I, I do think F, the very, the earliest church was a Presbyterian church because the word Presbyterian refers to church government. Um, St. Jerome said that at first elder was identical with bishop until some people just took more power. I don't think a, a Episcopal church structure is like wrong morally. Also, I've never actually been in a world with these structures before. I don't think an Episcopal church structure is like the wrong way to do it. I just don't think it's the way that the Bible describes. It's, the Bible doesn't say you must use this structure of government, but the structure of government in the Bible is a Presbyterian church government. It's it's not what the Catholics have. Of course, they will dispute that. They will say that when um, Peter was appointed, he was being appointed as the first pope. I don't think you can really justify that. I don't know. I, there are some Catholics who even admit that the early church did have a Presbyterian government, and that the Episcopal government structure de developed over time, they would just say, well, a lot of things develop over time and it doesn't invalidate them. But yet there are certainly Catholics who would admit that the early church was Presbyterian in terms of government, and I need to stay here so I don't die. Okay, I'm gonna have to eat some bread. Um, so yeah, um, I don't think that the Presbyterian tradition is like the only one that's faithful to the early church. I just think it's has the best grasp on truth out of all the traditions. I think it's the doctrines of Presbyterianism are the doctrines taught in the Bible, and that's why I believe that. And it's definitely not the only true Christian tradition, but I think it's the one that is the most true. It has the most grasp on truth on the most number of issues, if that makes sense. I don't think it's perfect. I think um, historic Reformed views on like spiritual gifts are really not the best. Um, I don't, I'm not a radical cessationist as a lot of reform people are. I'm also just exploring this cave because I've never actually seen a, one of these caves in, in real life. I've only seen videos of them. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not the only way to do it, but yeah, I think it has the best grasp on truth. Like I said, okay. Thoughts on the crusades. Well, I can tell you this much. The Crusades were not at all what they were taught as in my public high school. My public high school said the Crusades were a bunch of mean Christians going and killing a bunch of peaceful Muslims. That's not what happened at all. Um, the Crusades were mostly a defensive war. They were not nearly as violent as people think. Um, over the course of 200 years, the Crusades killed fewer people than the Vietnam War, for example. So they weren't even that big a deal. They were kind of like anticlimactic, to be honest. Um, but I think the Crusades had a lot of terrible stuff involved, a lot of really bad abuses of power, especially because, like, the Pope was saying, hey, if you fight in the Crusades, you'll get out of purgatory, so come on, fight. Um, so the Crusades weren't, like, I, I th we should be careful not to over-romanticize them. We should also be careful not to make them sound worse than they actually were. I, I do believe in, in just war, 
uh, like St. Augustine did. So there is some wars are just, and some aspects of the Crusades, such as defending Christendom against rising Muslim empires, were justified. Because Islam, in the beginning, unlike Christianity, spread by military force. It did not spread purely by conversions. Of course, there were conversions, but Muhammad himself was a very violent and aggressive conqueror. Um, so yeah, it wasn't just um, people converting. Okay, um, will there be... Uh, oh, someone asks, is contraception sinful? I think Protestants should be against it too. I'm kind of conflicted on this issue. I'm inclined to say as long as contraception's used within the context of marriage, not used as an excuse to sleep around, it should be fine. Um, but it used to be that Protestants, even the conservative ones, like the Southern Baptist Church, it used to be that Protestants were pro-choice and Catholics were pro-life. The Catholics ended up being right on that one. So I'm wondering, okay, what if the Catholics are right about the issue of contraception as well? So I would give a very shy and timid no to is contraception inherently sinful, knowing that there's a good chance I'm wrong. All right? That's my answer. Okay. Um, someone asks, will there be internet memes in the resurrected world? I sure think so. Um, everything good will be restored, and that includes memes. Because humor is good. We talk about the attributes of God. God is perfect in every way. He's a being, um, he's that than which no greater being can be conceived. Um, so if there is something conceivable that is greater than God, then that thing is God. So we talk about how this means God is all-powerful, all-good, all-loving, all-knowing. What we often forget is God is also infinitely funny. If you read the Bible, God has a great sense of humor. He is hilarious. Um, I think, um, honestly, like modern gender theory, for example, is God's way of just showing how ridiculous people turn into when they start rejecting God. So, yeah, God is very funny. And, of course, there will be memes in the resurrected world. There will be tons of jokes. There will be better, better jokes. You remember, like, the Mon Monty Python sketch where there's, like, the funniest joke in the world? So funny that people died hearing it and it was, like, used as a weapon of war? It'll be like that, except because there will be no death. We're not going to actually... It, it's, it will, there will be jokes that are funny enough to kill you, but they won't actually do that because it'll be the new heavens and the new earth. Anyway, um, do you think we should have, do church and have the same theology as the early church? I mean, not to an absolute extent, because from the very beginning of the early church, there were disputes. Everyone's like, oh, we're like the early church. Okay, which early church? Um, the one in Corinth where they were so sexually immoral that Paul said even the pagans were disgusted by how sexually immoral they were? So no, the early church isn't some magic template for us to use. The, whiz the insights of the church fathers help us interpret scripture. Scripture is our authority, though. Um, yes, I, I am still a historic Protestant, even though I'm a high church Protestant. Uh, so we should look to the early church for inspiration. We don't need to copy them every step of the way. That's not necessary. We are in a completely different time and situation than they are. Like, for example, for the most part, people in the early church were pacifist. I'm not. Like I said, I believe in just war theory. So it, there, it's okay on some issues to say I disagree with, with that. Like, also, in the early church, most people believed that you can lose your salvation. I'm a Calvinist, I don't believe that, even though my view of this isn't quite the same as, like, a, a Baptist once saved, always saved. I think you can fall away from the faith, because I think you can... Ah! Okay, that was embarrassing. I think you can, in a real sense, be a Christian without being, like, regenerate. Speak if, if you're part of the covenant. Okay, um... Once, once I respawn here, then I'm going to go back and get all my stuff. Okay, someone asks, can you contrast Baptist theology with early church theology? Yeah, the sacraments. Everyone in the early church believed baptism saves, and we received the real body and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Baptists, generally speaking, do not believe that. So, yeah, that's, that's the big difference. There are a lot of differences. That's the big one. Also... You could argue the early church was Presbyterian in, in government. You could argue it was like more Episcopal in government. I really don't see how you could argue that it was Congregationalist in government, and that's what most Baptist churches are um, in terms of their church structure. Okay, also, I need to run back to where I just died to get my stuff because 
like I died in a cave and I need to go back and get my stuff really quickly, actually. I shouldn't dawdle. Um, I'm just taking a few things with me. I need to pack a lunch because if I don't get it in time, my stuff's going to disappear. It's going to be a huge pain in the butt to re-mine all those diamonds that I lost. Um, at least I explored that new terrain. It was like I said I wanted to see one of those big caves. I saw one for like a microsecond and then I died. Okay, I guess I'll bring some cooked salmon with me. Uh, I'll craft stuff along... Okay, there's probably some wood. No, there's not. I spent all the wood by building that, um, those note blocks thing that play the, the music. Okay, looks like I'm just walking... I'm walking here. Hey, I'm walking here! I am from New York, but sometimes I exaggerate my New York accent for comedic effect. Okay, someone asks, can you go into more in depth of what fundamentalism is? Yes. Fundamentalism was a reaction against modernism in the church. When the mainline Protestant churches began having liberal theology, saying maybe we don't believe in the resurrection, maybe we don't believe in the virgin birth, all this, um, fundamentalism was a reaction against that. Most of the time, a reaction against a bad thing creates a new bad thing. So fundamentalism has a lot of elements that I don't agree with. Um, generally, it's like a retreat from mainstream institutions out of distrust, and I think we need to do the opposite. I think we need to retake mainstream institutions, not run away from them. So yeah, I definitely disagree with fundamentalists there. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff I disagree with fundamentalists on. Like, for example, I'm not a young earth creationist, and young earth creationism is one of the unquestionable dogmas of fundamentalism. So yeah, that that's a big thing. Um... That's a big reason why I'm not a why I'm not a fundamentalist. Okay, I hope this person doesn't mind me using their farm. I'm, I'm so it's an emergency. I need to get my stuff. So yeah, that's um, but yeah, fundamentalism is a reaction against modernism, and for the most part, my biggest problem with it is it's characterized by a retreat from all mainstream cultural institutions. It's it's a movement. It started in the early 20th century that said basically homeschool all your kids, hide from the culture. The culture is sinful, just retreat and wait for Jesus to come back. And that's why fundamentalists usually exist in, like, rural areas. Um, like, if you go to, I don't know, rural Tennessee, you'll find a lot of people who, I don't know, there were, there were stories of people back in the 80s who would sell their barn because they thought Jesus was coming back in 1988. Stuff like that. A lot of that is fundamentalism. And I, I know, like, fundamentalists will say, oh, we're not neo-evangelicals, we're, there's a difference, and I don't know. For me, a mainline Protestant, it all looks just kind of like a bunch of people who are running away from the church and then wondering why things are so weird. Um, okay. Someone says, do you accept any of the Marian dogmas other than Mother of God? That's a good question. I'm trying to figure that out. So, the Catholic Church has a lot of dogmas, or a lot of truths, that things they, they say are true, are surrounding Mary. And one of them is, the most fundamental one, is that she's the Mother of God. Now, that one is affirmed by the early church councils. The Council of Ephesus says Mary is the mother of God. And absolutely, we should all be saying Mary is the mother of God. Not because we agree with all the Catholic doctrines about Mary, but because Jesus is God. If we say Mary is the mother of God, we're saying Jesus is God. And if we say Mary is not the mother of God, we're implying Jesus isn't God. That was what Nestorius did. Nestorius still it said Jesus was God, but he separated his humanity from his divinity. And that's what a lot of modern evangelicals do when they say, oh, Mary is just the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God. No, Jesus is God. Um, the personal terms Jesus and God are, inter are interchangeable. So we need to confess that Mary is the mother of God if we're to have a right view of who Jesus is. But do I accept any other Marian dogmas other than that? The only one I might accept is the perpetual virginity of Mary, but I'm not even sure. Because... I don't really see why we need to believe the perpetual virginity of Mary from Scripture. The only reason I'm considering it is because so many people, including all the Reformers, even Zwingli, believed that Mary was always a virgin. Now, you don't want to be more low church than Zwingli, alright? Zwingli believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary. He argued that she's the new Ark of the Covenant, and that means she must be kept pure and defiled. Um, pure and undefiled. I, but I don't see why sex would make something defiled if it's in the right context. Um, I don't know. So, for 
the answer to that question is there's one other Marian dogma I'm considering, the perpetual virginity. I just need to hear a really good argument for it. And so far I haven't yet, but I also haven't really looked into the really good arguments for it. I know that like Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, Augustine, Aquinas, they all, all these titans believed in it. So that's why I'm considering it. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm just running at this point. I feel like because I just updated the server, it's more laggy when I'm in water because some of the kelp blocks that you see over there are like changing. I don't know. Um, I'm looking on my, I'm using two monitors right now. I'm looking at my desktop and the desktop says that there's a lot of lag because of that. So I don't really know what's going on, but I'm just going to try and walk on land. It'll probably disappear before I get there, but you know, I'll say it was worth a try. Um, next one is, could you please include the evangelical free church or the, um, in your posts? Yeah. So the evangelical free church is something that formed out of Lutheranism, but was in many ways a break from Lutheranism, because it's a lot more like Baptist theology. Um, I do have a badge for them, I just don't use it a lot, because, I don't know, it's not one of the main ones, but they come out of the Pietist tradition. So yeah, I will talk, I'll try to talk about that more. Um, someone says, uh, thoughts on The Chosen, which is a TV series about Jesus. Okay, two reasons why I'm not a fan. One is that, in general... I'm skeptical of images of Christ. The Reformed tradition historically is against images of Christ because the second commandment is don't make images of God. Jesus is God. So, and I know there's the other side is has a good argument saying, oh, in the incarnation, the invisible God was made visible. So, but it's like, we don't know what Jesus looked like. So I don't want to associate a face that's not Jesus with Jesus. So that's why I'm not strictly iconoclast. I would say I'm more of an iconoskeptic. I think generally the less detailed an image of Christ is, the better. Like, a lot of those icons, those Eastern icons, are very not detailed, which makes them better, in my opinion, than, like, a, a detailed painting or detailed statue. Of course, the most detailed thing is, like, a video, like a movie about Jesus, which is why I'm not a fan of that. Another thing is that The Chosen, it was revealed, um, I think the parent company of the, the thing that makes The Chosen is Mormon, and that's a huge no-no. So, and I think uh, the, the Chosen quoted the Book of Mormon once. So, yeah, I, I would stay away. Um, I'm not going to be super legalistic about it. It's just, it's not something I'm going to watch. Uh, I know people might disagree, and okay, that's fine. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over cold. Um, I had a cold during finals for the second time in a row. I don't know what's up with that. So, okay, explanation of infant baptism. I already did that. Orthodox view of salvation. Okay, so the Orthodox believe in something called theosis. They don't like talking about um, salvation in strict, like, legal and judicial terms like the West does. Um, both Catholics and Protestants have in common that they talk about a lot about, like, okay, how does justification work? How does, um, uh, how does one made, right, declared righteous legally, forensically before God? And the Orthodox prefer to talk in terms of, like, being pure versus being polluted. Um, so their view is called theosis. Uh, crap. I, the, so, someone who designed this... I, I, it wasn't me who built this subway. Whoever designed it had a real, used a really weird command for this, and it clogged my inventory with a bunch of minecarts. Uh, of course, this world is, is generally a survival world, but occasionally people do weird things that I try to stop them from. Um, anyway... But, uh, okay. Yeah, so the, the Orthodox view is called theosis, which is a participation in the divine nature. This, so they see salvation as oneness with God, essentially. And there's some truth to that, but a better way to express it is union with Christ. By our union with Christ, we're also united to God. They have a more direct union with God because they believe that the Holy Spirit does not proceed from Christ. He only proceeds from the Father. Whereas everyone else believes the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So it's, it's an interesting view. I, I think union with Christ is a better way to express it than theosis. But, yeah. Um, okay. Where was, someone asks, where was the church before Martin Luther? It was there. I, once again, Martin Luther didn't start the church. Uh, a lot of, there are some, like, radical Protestants, like a, a, a John MacArthur type, for example who would basically make it sound like real Christianity was lost from, like, maybe Constantine in 300 
to the Reformation in the 1500s. I don't take that view at all. The true church was there the whole time. Martin Luther reformed the church that was there. All right? Um, and he wasn't the only one who reformed it. There were many... There were reformers before Luther, like Huss and, like, Wycliffe. Okay, someone said, would you ever quit uploading theological stuff? No. It's like, why would I? Um, so... Someone asks, uh, what can we do to end Christian infighting and re recognize our different roles? That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say, like, okay, we, the way to not do it, the way not to do it is by ignoring differences and pretending like we're all just the same. Because when that happens, it's just one tradition wins out over the other. So a lot of times when people say, let's unite, what they mean is let's become, let's all become my thing and not your thing. The, the right way to do it I would say, is um, recognize and maybe celebrate the diversity of Christendom. And uh, again, I know the um, Eastern Orthodox people are going to be really mad about me being ecumenical because they don't like that. <coughs> but I think it's the right way to do it. Because if we want Christianity to be united, there needs to be unity in one sense and diversity in another sense. We are united in terms of who Jesus is, in terms of the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, um, aside from the whole filioque thing, um, but it, it's okay because the Orthodox are never going to be ecumenical anyway. Um, and, uh, there we are, we disagree on things, but what we agree on is more important than what we disagree on. Okay. Um, someone says, was the leadership of the early church Presbyterian, Episcopal, or Independent? I would say it started Presbyterian and got more Episcopal over time. A lot of people would disagree with that. That's what seems to be the case from my perspective as a Presbyterian. Someone asks, what are your views on eschatology? I'm amillennial, um, as I said. Someone asks, uh, what's your point of view when it comes to Israel, the Israelites? Okay, this is a spicy one. So, um, not sure exactly what the question means. I'm pretty sure they're just asking, do I believe that Israel, modern Israel, as in, like, the Jewish people, ethno-cultural Jewish people, are the chosen people. Now, I've changed my views on this. I've changed my mind. Because I am ethnically Jewish, just ethnically, I was never religiously Jewish, but because I'm ethnically Jewish, I used to sort of take pride in that, and I, was just, I said the Jews are God's chosen people, because a lot of the, like, right-wing accounts I followed also said that. Um, it was just something I heard, and I repeated, because I liked how it, it sounded like it was right to me. But, no, I've changed my view on that. That's from bad theology. That view comes from dispensationalism. Um, the correct view is that God's chosen people are those who have faith in God. Those who have faith in God are those who have faith in Christ. So, um, Christians in today's world are the chosen people, not the Jews. Uh, if, if there's someone who's, like, ethnically or even, even like, culturally Jewish who's um, a Christian, then they're one of the chosen people, but it's because they're a Christian. So, the only people who are the chosen people are people who are Christian, right? The church is Israel. The state of Israel today is not Israel in a biblical sense. It's just a state that calls itself Israel. All right, um, now, if you're going to ask, well, what's my view on the whole Israeli conflict? Um, do I, what do I think of the Jews in general? I'm not going to get into that because I don't even really know. I would say... I, I, I avoid weird conspiracy theories. I don't know. Okay. Someone asks, what's the weirdest doctrine from any denominations, in your opinion? Okay, that is a good question. What is the weirdest doctrine? So, of course, I could always go to some, like, cults that have really weird views, but I'm probably not going to do that. I would say, um, in terms of the weirdest doctrine... I would say the Methodist view of entire sanctification is not really something I can wrap my head around, or like their idea of two works of grace, um, where there's one where you become a Christian, another one where you like achieve your final sanctification. Um, that that always seemed really weird to me. I know if I had more time to think, I'd probably think of a weirder doctrine that exists, but um, okay. Okay, good starting point book-wise to check out traditional Protestant churches. Jo anything by Jordan B. Cooper, really, um, especially his book, uh, In Defense of the Good, True, and the Beautiful. Okay, someone asks, uh, legalism versus antinomianism. Basically, two opposite 
wrong beliefs. Legalism is where you obsess too much over the rules and act like the rules actually can save you. And antinomianism is where you say we shouldn't have rules at all because salvation is by faith. Yet, just because something's not necessary for salvation doesn't mean it's not necessary. The law of God is necessary to make us better, to make a better world. It's not necessary to save us. Only grace through faith can save us. Okay. In the new heavens and the new earth, all evil will be destroyed. So that means there's no struggle to be had. What's the point? Well, there's no struggle, but there still is productivity. Like I said, I think Minecraft can be a good illustration of the new heavens and the new earth because we will do creative things. It'll be, we'll be participating in God's work of creation. Uh, so the new heavens and the new earth won't be just sitting around on a cloud playing harps for all eternity. It's like this world is supposed to be. It's like everyone feels like this world is supposed to be, but it's not. Um, <coughs> someone says, Is it okay to listen to secular music that doesn't celebrate any sin? Yes. Again, one of my pet peeves is when people act like the only two options are like modern pop or hip-hop or the garbage Christian rip-offs of it. Technically, Mozart counts as secular music, okay? Um, listening to the Star Wars soundtrack counts as secular music. When most people say secular music, they're probably referring to, like, hip-hop or something. Now, I personally just don't like that style of music, but that's me. Um, yeah, listen to whatever you want. I would just say... I'm, I, I'm not legalist about that. I would just say, make sure you also listen to sacred music. And by sacred music, I don't just mean any Christian music. So, like, contemporary Christian music, it is Christian, but it's not sacred. It doesn't have a sacred quality. And people will try to argue with me, we all intuitively know it's true. We all know that, like, um, a traditional hymn has more of a sacred quality than Hillsong, right? Don't try to argue, because if you do, you know you're lying to yourself. Um, okay, someone says Christian nationalism. Okay, yeah. This is a term that a lot of people misuse. So, both the media... So the media has started by saying, like, any, Christ, any conservative Christian who wants to make the culture or the country more conservative and Christian is a Christian nationalist. That's not what Christian nationalism is. Christian nationalism is, like, conflating patriotism with Christianity, acting like... Like, of course, it's good to be patriotic, yeah. But Christian nationalism, in its proper defini definition, means thinking God somehow favors your country. So... Like, I don't know, a lot of people during World War One, you could say were Christian nationalists. They believe God favored their country over other Christian countries. <coughs> so, no, God favors the kingdom of God. So, um, by its proper definition, no, I'm not a Christian nationalist because I don't think, um, I don't think that singing America the Beautiful should be part of our religious devotion. I don't think we should sing America the Beautiful in church. You can sing it on your own time if you want. If you want to be patriot, sure. Um, I'm somewhat patriotic, even though it's really hard to be patriotic when America is promoting immorality all over the world. I'm patriotic for what America could be. I guess you could say that. Um, uh, but, yeah... Christian nationalism as defined by the media and as a lot of conservatives have just appropriated, have sort of reclaimed, where it's like anyone who wants to make the country more Christian. Obviously, I want to make the country more Christian. That's n not Christian nationalism, though. That's just be called being someone who's culturally conservative. Someone who's conservative and cares about conserving more than just the GDP, like a lot of Republicans do. Uh, sorry. Uh... Someone asks about speaking in tongues. I'm not going to answer that because I just... That! Ah, almost died again. I'm not going to answer that because I just don't know. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Okay. Someone says, uh, What's your favorite book of each of the Old Testament and the New Testament? So my favorite book of the Old Testament... I don't know. I, I used to say Exodus. Now I, I'm not really sure. Now I might say... Proverbs is a really good book. It, I, honestly, it might be Proverbs. Um, and the New Testament, Romans, for sure. Romans is the best presentation of Christian theology in a systematic way. Um, now, an important thing is I don't think 
we have to rely solely on Paul for the gospel. Jesus does preach the gospel because the gospel isn't defined strictly as salvation by faith. It's also defined as the kingdom of God. And a lot of, um, as a product of the Reformation, a lot of people miss that. That's one of the good things, I think, about mainline Protestant churches, that they see the gospel in a more kingdom-defined sense. Now, the gospel is that the kingdom has begun. Working for the kingdom is not the gospel. Working for the kingdom is law, which we still need to do. But we aren't saved by working for the kingdom. We are saved by faith in Christ, which makes us part of the kingdom. Okay, this is a fun question. Someone says, explain the Zoomerverse lore. Okay, um, so the Zoomerverse is not something I tried to create. It's just something that happened. So I'm redeemed Zoomer, right? One day, my girlfriend, who's been my girlfriend for several years, decided to make an Instagram, and she called herself the future Mrs. Zoomer. There's a whole story about how we met. The reason we met is because a few years ago, I tried to do sort of what I'm doing now with a different Christian account, but it failed. I got absolutely nowhere. Um, the only thing I got on that Christian account, it had like 30 followers, is that um, someone noticed me online and saw based on my instagram bio that i was very similar to her friend so she um told her friend that her friend should invite me to her bible study and the per the the girl who invited me to her bible study because her friend asked her to and ended up becoming my girlfriend 13 days later we we're from completely different parts of the country but we met online we started courting within 13 days this was back in 2020 during covid and the girl who set us up um has been our mutual friend ever since then. Um, and once my girlfriend made her Instagram account called the future Mrs. Zoomer, um, our, the third friend, uh, she also made an account called redeemed Zoomer third wheel because she always joked about how she was like always third wheeling us, you know? Um, so that, that happened. And she was always, um, she was, she was looking for a boyfriend. So she did this as a joke. But she said, fourth wheel applications are open. Like, literally advertising to all of my followers that she's once, like, a boyfriend. It was mostly a joke she did that. I don't think she was actually looking for a boyfriend on there. I, I have to ask her, though. But one of my friends from college made an account completely as a joke. Some people think he was being serious. It wasn't serious. Called Redeemed Zoomer Third Wheel Simp basically an account dedicated to simping for her and like pretending to be in love with her and wanting to date her and ah lag i went off the edge of the world now and the joke was that she would just constantly reject him and he would constantly do ridiculous things to try and appeal to her so here's my friend from college at first we didn't know who made the account called redeem zoomer third wheel simp we soon found out it was him um I found it was him because I suspected it might have been him, so I went I went up to him at lunch one day. I texted on that account. I saw the notification appear on his phone. That's so I caught him. So it was just the four of us for a while until um, I ended up setting up Redeem Zoomer Third Wheel with one of my followers whose identity will not be disclosed, but he was one of my big fans, and yeah, now she is dating him. So that's another addition to the Zoomerverse lore. And so, Redeem Zoomer Third Wheel Simp had to move on. You know, again, this is all just a joke. It's, don't take it too seriously, because some people are actually taking seriously and worried that this is... No. Um, he has to move on. So there's another person who follows me who is, like, really non-denominational Baptist, and she jokes about how she's, like, Walmart ba brand Christianity. So she made an account called Walmart Fundamentalist, and now um, Redeem Zoomer Third Wheel Simp became Walmart Fundamentalist Simp, so now he's simping for her instead. So that's the Zoomerverse lore. It was not something I tried to create. If I did create it, I wouldn't have created something as silly as that, but it just sort of happened. There's nothing I could do about it, but it has made reformed Instagram a lot more entertaining, so I guess that's a good thing. Okay, someone asks, what will be the future of Christianity in the West? Horrible unless we retake the mainline church. Someone says, have you ever been something else other than Presbyterian before? As long as I've been Christian, I've been Presbyterian. When I became Christian, I joined a Presbyterian church, and that's what I've been ever since. Um, 
Someone asks, how should the church interact with the youth, um, and what role should apologetics play? Um, I think the way to interact with Gen Z is instead of giving rational arguments, which won't work because of how irrational and stupid Gen Z is, we should present Christianity as a way to have meaning, purpose, and community. Because that is what Gen Z is really starved for. And I think that is what might actually be effective in helping Gen Z, helping young people become more Christian. Um, someone says, when is it right to leave a church that doesn't align with your values? Here's, it depends on one big thing. Is it a church that's worth preserving? <coughs> so case A is this has been a really big historic church that's existed for 500 years at the center of your city. It's starting to go woke. Should you leave it? Absolutely not. You should fight tooth and nail to your last breath to preserve it. If this church is some random non-denominational church that sprang up like 10 years ago and doesn't align with your values, yeah, leave it. I don't care. Um, it depends on if this church is something worth preserving. So, I don't know. If it's a really big, important, and culturally significant church, yeah, fight to fight to the death for it. If it's um, just a random, like, church that has no historical cultural rooting, yeah, you can leave if it, if you don't, if you, if you feel like you should leave, then do it. Someone asks, what am I studying? Math and music. Okay, uh, someone asks my thoughts on Calvinism and why it's controversial. So my thoughts are that I'm a Calvinist, but we need to define what Calvinist is properly. So a lot of people define Calvinism as the five points of Calvinism. And I don't think that's the way to define it. It's it's a tradition. Just as Lutheranism and Catholicism are tr uh, Christian traditions. And it includes a bunch of beliefs. So um, when I say I'm Reformed or Calvinist, that doesn't mean just that I adhere to TULIP. It means that I am part of the Reformed tradition and Generally, I agree with the beliefs of the Reformed tradition, including TULIP. But even TULIP is often misrepresented. Like, for example, like, limited atonement doesn't mean that Jesus only, that the atonement of Jesus was limited. It means that it's, the atonement of Jesus is infinite in worth, but it will only actively cover the individual sins of a limited number of people. All right, so that's all the questions for today. That was really long, and I'm probably going to completely lose my stuff. Oh, well. But thanks for watching that. Um, this is a really long video, but you guys had a lot of questions, okay? So, yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.